Louise Hay film, Dyer Interview, take one. It, it seems to me that I have always known this, um, and that I came into this world knowing that, that um, you become what you think about, uh, wh whether you want it or not. Um, I was really very blessed. I, I lived in, a, in an orphanage un, until I was 10, uh, in a series of foster homes um, uh, with my, my older brother, but he was uh, sick uh, quite a bit. He was very anemic, and, and I, uh, I used to have to help him uh, as a young boy. I was, he was 16 months older than I was, and this was when I was four, five, six, and seven, and so on. <clears throat> and I can remember... Um, I can remember I lived out in, in Mount Clemens, Michigan, at, at 231 Town Hall Road with a lady. Her name was Mrs. Scarf, and she, she had uh, a lot of children would come and go from there. Um, and I was in a foster home because um, the circumstances at that time um, were such that my father had walked out on his family, and um, I was born uh, in the Depression, and there was uh, there was no welfare and things like that in those days, so it was like people just helped each other out. And my mother was working as a candy girl uh, in Detroit, on the east side of Detroit, earning $17 a week. Uh, and she uh, she just didn't have the money and wasn't able to uh, provide for her children. So w we lived out at this one particular place. And um, I can remember um, whenever a new student would, a new child would come to the house, they would always say, go find Wayne. And I would be out in the back. Um, they had orchards there, and uh, this was no hardship. This was no difficult thing for me. This was a great blessing, I think, in my life. Uh, these, uh, these, those earliest days. And I can remember a girl came, a girl named Martha came, and they were dropping her off for basically the same reasons that we were dropped off there. And they said, "Go find Wayne." And I came and I started talking to, uh, to Martha and. Uh, and she was crying, and she was all upset, and she was sad. And I, I was trying to convince her that she didn't have to be sad. That this was, I remember saying to her, "This is a great place. There's no parents here. You, know, you, can, <laughs> you can, you you can do pretty much uh, anything that you want. I mean, you've got a lot of freedom, and we're going to have a great time." And and I, and I can remember being in school uh, at, at the public school. It was a numbered school. They didn't even name them in that day. It was PS number 127, and. Um, and I remember the teachers, um, one time uh, we were out in the playground and all the kids were all upset and, and I said, what's wrong? And they said, well, the teacher said this is the worst class that she ever had and she was so all, all upset and she was angry and she was hurt and, and, and I said, well, why would you allow her opinions to have anything to, if, if, you know, if this is her hardest day, then her life is just easy, you know, and, and I can remember talking to other people about um, all you have to do is change the way you think. And it goes from being a miserable experience or a tough experience or a hard experience to uh, to one that you can do anything that you want with. And and when I my, my mother got our family all back together again when I was nine nine almost ten years old. Um, and I can remember her telling me what it was like when I was just a baby, when I was just like an infant, that I was I was the one child that uh, could make um, everybody else laugh. At, at times when when everybody else would, she said we were waiting for a bus one time when we were just real baby before I went into the orphanage, and um, she said a a, a, a a car came by and there was it was in Detroit and there was all this slush and it just and we all went flying down we had everybody had dirt on them and, and, and dirty snow and we were laying in the in the ground and everybody was crying and she said you were the and upset and mad because our clothes were wet and so on and she said you just uh, stood up and said. Uh, this is great, isn't this wonderful? Look, you know, we don't have to do this, and we don't, you know, just turning it into something positive. It's like, so the, the ability to be able to do that was something, I can't remember a time in my life when I didn't know that um, if, I, if I really went to work on, on how I thought, that things just didn't have to be bad. I was the richest kid in the orphanage. I was, that's, I've, all, I've talked about that many times in my lectures, that uh, a snowstorm was a time we, we had one. We had two snow shovels at the at the at the at the home, and one of them uh, one of them had the the edges all curled up from hitting the curbs, and you couldn't make any money with that one. So the other one, when it would snow, I would go downstairs and I would take the good snow shovel and I would put it under my bed and I'd sleep with it right right with me in the bed so that nobody else would get it. And I would get up before everybody else got up and I would go out and I would just shovel everybody else's snow, uh, shovel the walk. 
And then later on, and I'd just go knock on the door and just tell them that I shoveled their walk. And they'd say, some would say thank you, and some would give me a dime, which doesn't sound like much, but that's about $3,000 in today's money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, and when I found out that soda pop bottles, for example, were, uh, were worth two cents each, that if you took them back, you could get two cents back, I mean, that was just like one of the great awarenesses and awakenings of my life because I would follow people around who were drinking a Coca-Cola and say, uh, you almost done with that? <laughs> they said, well, no, I'm not going well, just whenever you win, I just follow them and then we'll walk in until, and I had a whole, we had a coal bin where we lived because it was coal furnaces and, and I would, f we filled that coal bin with, uh, with soda pop bottles and I would take it back. It was just always, it was just always easy to change and all the other kids would be uh, not having any money and complaining about not being able to have abundance or be able to have some some level of being able to buy themselves like a, just a little donut or a, a, a Pepsi Cola or something they they couldn't figure it out and it always seemed so easy to me that all you had to do is just look around and and see the opportunities in anything and it it had nothing to do with whether there are opportunities there there always are opportunities you know I'm I'm 67 years old I have never ever been unemployed or even can even can't even deal with the concept of unemployment I, it isn't that I've had no job I've always had more jobs than I've and it isn't because I've been through all good economic times there've been there've been some pretty sour economic times over the last 50 years or so I just have never known how to think any other way than uh if you change the way you think about things, you, you, you can create whatever it is you want for yourself in your life. It's just a simple knowing. I mean, I've made a living talking about it. I've written lots of books about it and so on. But I have always lived it and practiced it, and I still do today. It was Thomas Troward. I don't know. He did some lectures on mental science way back in the uh, 1907, 1908. He was from Scotland. And one of the things that he said is that the, 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 the law of flotation was not discovered by the contemplation of the sinking of things. Um, so that, you know, like before the 15th and 16th centuries, um, all of the ships were made out of wood. Uh, not because iron wasn't available and steel wasn't available, but because there was a belief that wood floated. So therefore you had to make ships out of things that floated. That's literally how the... And then someone came along and said that it has absolutely nothing to do with what things are made out of. It has to do with the amount of water that is being dispersed. That's, that's what determines whether something will float or not. And I think about that all the time because it's, it's in the contemplation of what you desire that you create what it is that you want to have for yourself. It's in your willingness to contemplate it. And, and nothing more, according to Troward and, the, and, the, and, and mental science. So that I think about the Wright brothers, you know, a hundred or so years ago, you know, it's like, and I said the law of flying was not discovered by the contemplation of the staying on the ground of things. So that these were two people, like for me to figure out how to get an airplane to fly and my limited knowledge of all of that, I would probably have contemplated the staying on the ground of things, you know, like this is what happened. But there's somebody came along and contemplated the idea that if you get enough speed going and you have the right design and you get pressure underneath something like this and you get that this thing is going to lift off off the earth. Somebody had to contemplate that idea. And everybody who contemplated that it wasn't possible, that it couldn't work, was a part of why flying didn't take place because there was no new law discovered in the, in the early part of the 20th century any more than, than, than electricity was discovered by you know, Thomas Edison or anyone like that. I mean, the ability to have electricity has always been there. Somebody has to contemplate. So it's like in your own personal life, your willingness to contemplate yourself as a person who is capable of attracting into your life what you want, having the kind of relationships that you want, being able to have abundance where, uh, where you know, scarcity always exists. All you have to do is begin the process by, having, by being willing to contemplate the presence of that in your life. And I've always been a person that I can remember throughout my life as someone who could contemplate myself being able to do things that most people couldn't. And I can give you a good example. When, I was, when my mother got us all back together and we were living in Detroit on the east side of Detroit and we got a new television set. It was a black and white, it was a screen about this big, it was an admiral and uh, we had it in our home and it was like, oh my god, black and white television, you know, uh, you remember Uncle Milty and, and all and so on. And um, the, there was a guy that was on TV, his name was Steve Allen and he was on The Tonight Show. And um, I was 11, 12, 13 years old. I was born in 1940, so I was 51 or 52. And I used to stay up every night and watch The Tonight Show. 
out, uh, uh, even though I had to go to school the next day. I, it was just something about that show and, you know, all of the characters and smock, smock, and all the things that uh, Steve Allen would do on it. And I would come down when I would be talking the next day, and I would be telling my mother and my two brothers that um, uh, when I do The Tonight Show, um, this is what I would say. I wouldn't have said the, what, what, what Louie and I say, the way reacted, how he reacted to that. I would have said this. And I used to do this, and my brothers and my mother would say, that's just Wayne. He's just, got, he's just nutty. He, he thinks he's on The Tonight Show. <laughs> he thinks he's going to do The Tonight Show. And I would go up into my room at, uh, you know, on this little tiny house that we lived in, you know, a little two-bedroom house that uh, five of us lived in because my mother remarried. And, uh, um, and I would just... I would see myself doing The Tonight Show. I would just practice it, and Steve Allen became someone that I was really enamored of. Well, you know, fast forward, uh, I don't know, 30 years or whatever so, and, it's, uh, and I've written a book, uh, Your Erroneous Zones, and the, the Tonight Show calls, and they ask me if I would like to come on. The, so I do my first uh, stint on The Tonight Show. I, I did the show like 37 times over a period of three or four years with all these different hosts, but Johnny Carson was on, and... Uh, the, the first guest on the very first show when I did the show was uh, was Steve Allen, and it, it was like something clicked in me that I had contemplated that as a child. I had always had a knowing, and I can remember sitting there talking to Johnny about this thing that you know, and Steve Allen was sitting there right next to me, and we were talking about that kind of thing. So that by putting my attention on something, it wasn't some deliberate thing that I was doing, you know, when I was 11 or 12 years old that was designating that I was going to be a person who was going to be uh, appearing on talk shows uh, 30 years from now. It was just an awareness to, a, a willingness to contemplate, to contemplate myself in that kind of a place. And I think the power of contemplation is the thing that most people haven't harnessed yet. And when we do, when you harness it in your life, there's absolutely no limit to what you can attract into your life. If you absolutely stay focused on what it is that you know you're going to manifest and attract, you're not going to do it in, in your time. You know, Jackson Brown sings a song, he says, and creation reveals its secrets by and by. I mean, you can't push the river. You can't, it's all done in divine time, but it will show. It will show. It, it, it will manifest. It will attract itself. And I'm never surprised any longer about anything that I put my thoughts on that I can attract it into my life. I just absolutely know that law of attraction and that, and that it absolutely works. Uh, and I have no, absolutely no doubt about it. And I feel, I feel as if, like, um, before I even came into this world, um, when I was in the world of spirit, that I had a conversation with God. And it was God saying to me, like, uh, what would you like to do in this lifetime? And I said, well, I'd, I'd really like to spend a lifetime teaching self-reliance. Because that's truly all I've ever done since the time I was just a little boy, through all my life. I mean, I could just l go through all of the things that I've done. It's all been always about teaching self-reliance. And God said, it's like, you're sure you want to spend a whole lifetime teaching self-reliance? I said, yeah, that's what I wanted. And he said, well, you, we better get your little ass into an orphanage then. <laughs> you know?